My name is Daryl James, and I volunteered for Solar Warden, the United States Navy Secret Space Program, in uh, 2003. I was in Iraq in 2002. When I was in elementary school, I remember I kind of wasn't really falling behind, but I was like a daydreamer and stuff like that. So they put me through a bunch of tests, and it was putting puzzles together, like in your head. You just kind of pointed at pieces, that one was there. It was just, it was kind of almost like building puzzles in your mind is how the IQ test felt to me. And uh, I, I all I remember is is my mom and the woman who tested me talking together. And my mom said, uh, is he smart? And she said, oh, yeah. And uh, she said he has a really high IQ, like really high IQ. And she, my mom asked, like, how high? And she said, well, we'd rather not say because it, we feel like it would give barriers to the kids and stuff like that. So she just told, she just told my mom, he has a college graduate level of IQ is all she really said to him. But she, I mean, I remember when I was a kid, she was like, yeah, it's high. Like, and that's all like, that was the only time I ever got an IQ test. I remember myself, my dad, my mom, well, both my parents, I found very smart. Um, I don't think I was, you know, surrogate or anything like that, but I remember like my dad was a telepath. And I remember that was just something very natural to me as a kid. It was just one of those things I kind of grew out of it and I forgot I could do it. But I remember him uh, talking to me as a kid. Just tell, like I remember he said, uh, I was sitting on a couch next to him. I was probably three, maybe four years old. And he said, uh, do you think you'll be able to do this when you get older? And we were just talking telepathically. And I said, yeah. He said, well, your sister could do it. And he said, your other brothers and sisters could do it too. But once they got to a certain age, they forgot. I think he said my brother Larry was the only one that remembered how to do it. And I remember saying, yeah, Dad, I don't remember. So I just remember being able to do that. And I remember meeting families that could do it and things like that. As a friend of my sister, a family we went to church with, things like that. And I remember meeting up with people every now and again that could do it. How I got started in the program was... I had to volunteer, I had, I had to escort these seamen, civilian workers into the underground base to, um, so they could fix a pump. It was just an air pump. It was just something really simple. And, uh, it was weird cause it was like the third day I was there and they're already giving me, you know, watch type things in an underground base. And I didn't work in the underground base. I worked in the garage uh, away from the underground base and, um, uh, so I esc went to escort them in. When we first walked in, there was a sliding glass door that opened up, and they walked in. And there was something that looked like a metal detector. And the first man said, I'm not walking through that bloody thing. So I thought, well, I don't want to walk through it either. And uh, there was a British guard behind a table, and he said, no, you walk through. So I just looked at it, and it looked like a metal detector. So I just thought, well, whatever, I'll walk through. And I walked through. I did the watch, I just sat on a chair, and these guys fixed the pump, and then I left. And then I had the Balls to 4 watch, which is the 0 4 a.m. watch that nobody wants. And uh, when I first walked in, I saw Michael Aquino at the uh, quarter deck, which is where you stand your watch. And he was at a table, and he was looking through papers in a, f in a file in a folder. And uh, I recognized him right away because I saw him on Oprah when I was younger. And he's got the curled up eyebrows and everything. He's pretty easy to recognize. And I said, hi, how you doing tonight, sir? And he said, oh, how you doing? I said, I'm all right. And I just, I don't know, I, I sat down for a moment and talked to him for a little bit. And then I said, I got to go on another round. And I left. And that's what I saw, Michael Kino. And then um, I had watched the next Friday. And on that watch, I was with a first-class petty officer who was the petty officer of the watch. He was a blonde, heavyset guy with a blonde mustache. And um, we were just sitting there, and he looked at a uh, he looked at the monitor, the computer in front of him, and he said, what do you think about that? And it was just like a picture. It looked like a picture of a stereotypical gray. It was black and white. It was just like this little gray, like looking up, kind of like at the, at the ceiling, looking up, looking up at a camera on the ceiling. And uh, he said, what do you think about that? And I said, what did you get that off, off the internet? And right next to that sliding door, there was this really high up uh, window, about six inches from the ceiling, six inches from the floor, is this big window, 
in the wall. And there was a room, like a separate room behind this window. And it was just standing there, like this little gray. And uh, he said, Does it, do you mind if it comes in here? And I, I said, uh, does it mind if I stare at him? And he, he said, no. And then it said no, too, in my head, kind of like the way they say. It's like a, like the voice of your own your own voice in your head. Kind of, it, it sounded like that. It said, no, I don't mind. And it walked out. And it had this little... Uh, pistol in his hand it looked like uh like brushed metal polished metal little pistol and as it was walking forward i kept on saying gun i thought it was a gun uh, you know i just got out of iraq like a few months ago and I kept on saying gun 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 and i stood up and they all said it's not a gun including it there was a guard the same guard behind, that let me into the uh, metal detector said i had to walk through the metal detector he was behind it now and, uh, yeah, he had his weapon at the ready instead of on his shoulder. So I kind of figured that the weapon was for me, not really for it. So I calmed down and I sat down and they walked up to me. I thought I was going to maybe inject me with something or take something. I thought maybe it was a syringe. I was like, well, maybe it's a syringe. Maybe it's not a gun. I was kind of trying to figure this out. And, uh, it just stood in front of me and right next to it was this like junky Dell computer and it took it apart, but so fast it was, uh, a machine it didn't have to guide, guide it in or anything like that it just boom 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 like as fast as you could do it it could do it and it hit it hit the screws every time and undid it and it was catching it in its hand it had really long fingers it had to like hold it kind of like in c shapes to keep its fingers from dragging on the ground it looked like you could pick something up without bending its back or knees off the ground and uh yeah took it apart kept all the screws in one hand popped out two gigs of ram Put them on a on like a table above it, you know, because it was short. So I put it on a table, grabbed two more gigs, snapped them in, put it all in, slid the cover back on, grabbed the drill again, and it just started like resetting, kind of like that. It kind of flicked its wrist, and it was able to just set a screw in between its fingers, and it's boom, 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 boom. It did it one after another, almost as fast as it took it apart. And he said, uh, "What do you think about that?" I walked away. You know, well, uh, give me a chance to look at it. I remember that it stood there for a good thirty seconds, and I would move to one side. And it kind of moved its head for me so I could see one side of its face and it moved the other side. And when I looked at its hands, it moved its hands back and forth so I could see all around its hands and everything. And then I just got kind of bored with it and uh, it walked away. And then the guard walked away. They both walked through to the underground base. And the first class petty officer said, do you think you could work around something like that? And I said, I don't know why not. And I think that's what it was for to see if I would, you know, yell out screaming or, or just watch it do whatever it did and i actually heard stories of about a guy who on the base later on uh, saying something about you know help me help me there's a lizard monster trying to get me or something like that and like the guys were all kind of teasing him on base for flipping out like that or something like that. i don't remember but uh, i remember that story and uh he uh yeah so i did that i watched it and i remember the first class petty officer he was giving me a bunch of questions and stuff like that. Um, he looked at the, at his computer and he said, you're smart. And I said, what do you mean? Like 140, 150 IQ. And he said more like 190, 185. And he said, uh, I said, how do you know that? And he said, do you see that machine you walked through when you first, you know, came to the base and it was the metal detector. And I said, yeah. And he's like, yeah, that does everything. And he started telling me things like, uh, you smoke, because at the time I smoked and he said, but you don't have any blood clots. And he goes, well, that's because you drank, you drank. And I used to drink back then. So he could tell, I guess I smoked. He could tell I drank. He could tell, he could just tell all these things of whether or not I had blood clots anywhere in my system. It was just like this completely really complex CAT scan. It, it, it just did everything. And, uh, he said, um, he asked me, if I had any tattoos and I said no and he said good the Germans don't like tattoos and I said uh, Germans and he said yeah there's Germans up there he kind of really didn't want to explain it almost like space he kind of explained it like uh, I don't know it was just he was just kind of avoiding the question I said you mean like space he goes yeah it's kind of like that he didn't really see it as space and he said they're on the moon and beyond and things like that and he said and there's other ones ones that look like us ones that don't and uh he was just being very vague and I really couldn't figure out what he was talking about. And, uh, asked me if I had any, uh, hobbies I do now or I used to do. And I said, well, I used to play classical guitar. 
And he said, oh, that's really good. I like that. And he's talking about the Germans and other beings and stuff like that. Um, and then he has, he said, you know, the guy, he was talking about the guy on base who did all the, uh, he did passed all the PRT tests with like top scores, the physical readiness test, did the most push-ups and sit-ups and ran the fastest. And I, everybody knows that guy. And I said, yeah, I know him. And he said, that's me. And I was like, what? And the guy was like 19 at the time or something. He's like, yeah, I'm 35 now. He's like, I joined the 20 year and back. And he was talking about the 20 year and back. And I remember the guy used to talk to this kid, almost like the way, he would scold him sometimes, almost the way like a father would scold his son or something if he was being, you know, obnoxious or something. And so I guess that whole thing about seeing yourself or whatever, two, two people at the same time in the same existence or whatever, I don't think it's that detrimental. But, uh, yeah, so I talked to that guy, did that. And then on the Monday, so I had that on Friday. And then on Monday, I was at my uh, workstation in the garage. And one of the guys came up and said, the, the executive officer wants to talk to you, the XO. And I said, oh, okay. And I, I remember I asked him, I said, is that common? Because I just got there. And I was like, wow, is that common? And he said, no. no. So uh, he was there and I walked with him. And we walked down the sidewalk. And at first we were just chit-chatting. And then once we got further away, he... Uh, said something like, how does it feel like to have a 195 IQ? And uh, I remember one of the guys on base, um, who was kind of a gossip, he told me that, uh, well, when that first class petty officer, when I was at the quarter deck, what, and he told me I had 195 IQ, he said, well, look, and I, he, I looked at the computer monitor, and there were all like these lines going across, and there were two lines close to each other at the very top, and there was like a separation, and there were more lines. He said, see, you're up here. He said, you're the second smartest guy on base. And they were color-coded and stuff like that, different lines. And he said, the guys that you work with are down here. They're at the bottom. And uh, he asked me why I was a CB. And I, I said, uh, which is what I, I was, construction battalion. And I said I had a marijuana paraphernalia charge when I was 19, so I could only do construction or be a cook. And, uh, yeah, he, he said, how does it feel? I have a your knife IQ. And then this guy on base, he told me, like, you know who the f smartest guy on base is? He used to talk to me in barracks. I said, no. He said, the XO, the executive officer. And his uh, first name was Robert. And uh, he said, yeah, he's the smartest one on base. And so I started talking to Robert whenever he called me from my workstation. Said, how does it feel? I have a your knife IQ. I said, uh, this close to 200. I said, but you'd know how that feels. And he goes, oh, so you know, huh? And I said, yeah, you're the only guy on base smarter than me. And he said, who told you? And I said, oh, I didn't realize. I kind of messed up. I didn't want to, you know, betray the guy. But I don't know. It wasn't that big of a deal. I, I told him. I said, yeah, everybody knows. Because the guys were all kind of talking about it. They're all, hey, we heard about you. We heard about your scores. And what did you? And then they were asking me, like, what did you think? What did you think about, you know? Big black eyes, long spindly fingers, kind of creepy looking. And I, oh, yeah. And it was weird because I forgot about it, which was the strangest thing. Maybe it was just because it, it, stuff like that is not supposed to exist. It was almost like my mind just said, nope, that didn't happen. You know, and it was almost like this is, that was a bad dream. But then when, when the guys were telling me about it, I realized it was real. And it, actually, whenever I was watching the thing take apart the computer, I was pinching myself with like my thumb as hard as I could on my thigh. And I gave myself a blood blister. It was almost like a way to... I remember the first class petty officer, he goes, what do you think you're dreaming? Because he saw me pinching my thigh. And I said, no, I, I want to remember in case you guys wipe my mind. Maybe I want to give myself like a physical mark. So maybe it's like a, a way to, you know, tell myself this really happened. And he said, oh, no, we're not going to wipe your mind. So I was talking to uh, the XO and uh, told me that. And I told him I know about him too. And then he said... Uh, I, Petty Officer James, have you ever heard of Project Solar Warden? And I said, no, sir. And he said, well, what about the United States Navy Secret Space Program? I said, no, but I think I could figure that one out. And he said, you see, we have this program. It's called the 20 Year and Back. He said, you volunteer for this program. We put you in. You do 20 years. We send you back in time 20 years. Age regress you 20 years. Wipe your mind. And you wake up in bed like nothing happened. And I remember I had such a hard time. I said I can remember, I said I could believe uh, time travel, maybe even wiping one's mind, but I, I found age regression so difficult to understand. I, I, I found it hard to believe. 
And he said, after what you just saw, you find that hard to believe. And I said, well, touche, sir, but yes. And he said, well, it's true. You don't want to convince me any further. The XO talked about Gary McKinnon. And Gary McKinnon, he was this guy from Scotland. And this was probably less than two years ago at the time. This was 2003. I think it happened like 2000, 2001, something like that. And he hacked into NASA and he found all these all this information about off-world officers and uh, ranks, social security numbers, names, um, photographs of cigar-shaped craft over the moon. And uh, the XO said, it's all true. He asked me if I knew, the, ever heard of it. And I said, yeah. And he said, it's all true, all of it. Off-world officers, cigar-shaped craft over the moon. And then, I don't know if I went to that. He, he, he said, that he, we, we, we have this program, it's called Solar Warden, United States Navy Secret Space Program. And uh, 20 years back, they told me about being age regressed. I would be put into the program, I'd be age regressed 20 years, and then um, my mind would be wiped, I'd be sent back in time 20 years, and then I'd wake up in bed like nothing happened. I was not promised money, and because um, I remember asking him, I said, we'll be getting paid for this. He said, no. And uh, he told me I'd make commander, and I'd make pilot. And his biggest thing, which was my biggest thing, I guess, at the time was, he said, I'd, with my scores, I could be a pilot of a four kilometer long starship. And that sounded all right. And he kind of really kind of, he's like, do you hear what I said? This is like the opportunity of a lifetime. And I remember I was like kind of, even then I was just, that seems so large, four kilometer long starship. And I remember I was just kind of like, you mean like a ship on the water? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like that. And he's like, no, up there. He just, yeah, it's up there. And it was just very matter of fact, and this was all just very difficult for me to believe the way he was just talking about this. Like he talked about almost like it was something I should have known, you know, something he knew his whole life, and I, I, that most people know. But for some reason, I didn't know. I don't know how to explain it. But uh, my biggest thing, the reason I did it, is I told him later on in the conversation. I said, uh, I walked through that machine, you know, going to the quarter deck, and it, it said it. It gave all these vitals. It told whatever I had blood clots, you know, whether I drank or smoked, my IQ. I said, uh, my father died of a heart attack of a, something called a Widowmaker, where he really didn't have any kind of warnings. It was just a piece of cholesterol built up in his artery and his heart. It broke off and he died. I said, if we had a machine like that, you know, we could have saved his life. I said, why isn't technology like that available to the public? And he started going on about things like, I don't know, you know, um, population control and you know it would just get out of hand and I said well there has to be like a side or something that wants to bring this to the public and I remember he said you mean like a traitor and I said no no nothing like that I said but this has got to be you know some sort of faction or side or there has to be a group of people that want to bring this to the public whether or not this has been implemented in airports with their metal detectors I couldn't say because I, I don't think so, but uh, it looked just like that. I mean, it was nothing different. It even had like a little ramp that you kind of had to pick your feet up so you wouldn't, you know, accidentally stub your toe. And I remember, I think I remember seeing like a flash of blue light or something walking through it. I think I went through it like twice, two or three times. They didn't have me go through it very much, but I remember seeing, I think just like a, I don't know, like a flash, a split second flash, or like a blue light or something. If they did tell me the name of the machine, I don't remember. I do believe the first class petty officer did tell me that because he, he gave the name. And I don't remember because it was just, uh, at the time, I mean, my reality was just falling down around me. And I, I was just kind of, and he was just shooting one thing after another at me. And I was just, I just saw this little, little brown thing, you know, and I, I had never seen anything like that before. And. I don't know. That's the best way I could put it. It's, it's just, it was just so altering to my reality that I, he was telling me things that it was just kind of just going one ear and out the other. And I was just trying to process like what's happening. And, uh, but yeah, I don't remember the name. He did give me the name. And I, whenever I said, uh, I mean, you mean the metal detector? And he said, yeah, I guess it does kind of look like that. Huh? But yeah, I remember also just in the underground base, if this is anything, just the guys who worked there, it was just really, they had to get, naked when they went in and weighed and then they had to get naked and get weighed again coming out and i think there could only be like a quarter pound discrepancy so in case you tried to swallow something or anything like that so it was really 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 
crazy. These are the guys who went deep into the base, and you know, I didn't have things like that. I remember I, I went down like a second time, and I don't remember what it was for to help some civilian contractors or construction workers, but I never saw anything again. I did go further, but as far as my memory, because at the time I had no memory, but I did go deeper. There are caverns and everything like that under the underground base, like carved out from the stone. And I, yeah, I, I got to see all that, but you know, at the time it just wasn't, you know, wasn't scary for me. wasn't anything. I remember going to stand watch sometimes at the quarter deck and having images kind of flash my mind of seeing this gray again, this little brown alien take apart a Dell computer. I remember that. I remember seeing someone walk past the quarter deck and they pointed at that window and they said, oh my God, you know, that, that I, I hate that window or something like that, they said. I remember going to like, I made brownies or something for the Navy ball for, you know, to raise money for the Navy ball, you know, give a dollar and eat a brownie or something. People made all these baked goods and I sat it down at the table and when I turned around, it was Michael Aquino and he was just standing there in his uniform and he was like smiling at me. And this was after he, you know, tortured me for a couple of days. But it was almost like I had no recollection. I had no memory of it at the time. And I remember him just me looking at him and him looking at me. And I think I said, I think I said something like, can I help you, sir? And he said, no, and walked away. Yeah, later on, I, I did have uh, memories of Michael Aquino and him torturing me for days. And I was drug under the, uh, I was take, taken deeper under, under the underground base. And it looked almost like Adobe Huts. It kind of reminded me of that technology that people talk about where you can put machines through that uh, turn the stone and earth into glass. It's so hot and it carves out the underground bases, but these were more just like hallways and there were doorways and things like that. And everything was smooth, but it was still like rock and clay, but it was carved out too. And I, I just remember as far as I remember coming to, and I was out of it. I had just got out of the uh, density chamber. And whenever you get either put up or pushed back down to the third, I was, was in fifth and I was pushed back down to the third. You go through almost like a temporary amnesia, I guess you would say, right? You really don't know what's happening. You're confused. Every, you really don't even know your own name. And uh, I remember being drug because I remember waking up the next, the morning after, or I did it Friday. I missed Saturday. I woke up on Sunday. I don't know where Sunday went, but I remember the tops of my feet had uh, clay on them. And I remember I had singed hair on the hair on my head, I had singed hair on my chest hair. And uh, so going back deeper underneath the, these, this underground base into the caverns, I remember being drugged by a man and a woman and I was naked and I remember the tops of my feet dragging onto the ground and that explains why I had clay on my feet, on top of my feet. And I remember uh, the man was on my left and the woman was on my right and they were wearing like black robes, black cloaks. And the woman said, uh, I'm tired. He's, he's heavy. You know, let's take a break. And the man said, okay. And she let go of me. And I was just kind of hanging with my, my left side. He was still holding me. And I was looking around. And I remember uh, this little girl, I think it was, scurried up in this cage. There were the, like these dog kennels. And they were stacked up. They were stacked up like, I don't know, probably three or four high by maybe four or five long, wide. And... Uh, she scurried up really quick and banged her hand, front hands on the uh, front of the cage. She was really white and her hair was uh, stringy and matted. Her eyes were really dilated and wide. She almost reminded me of like those kids from that movie, uh, The Grudge. Just extremely pale, very wide eyes, matted up black hair. Probably just from being so dirty. And... Uh, I remember the woman, she hit the front of the cage with her fist and she said, get the fuck back. And they, the girl kind of went back. And I remember just looking around and you saw like kids huddled up in the back corners of these cages and stuff just looking at me. And they're all the same thing, just very pale to the point where they were white. Uh, eyes were wide, uh, dilated, like they never saw the sun before. They had very dilated eyes. And then next to them, there was like this... Um, cage there was kind of like bars just embedded i guess you would say in the uh, earth and there was like this part just carved out of the earth it was just like this kind of a cage and uh the stand this 
there motionless was like this half spider and half man kind of thing it was like a chimera and uh, I had the bottom half of a spider and then I had like the torso of a man and it had like black wiry kind of spider hair going from the elbow to the forearm but instead of hands it just had like those two it had like two spider claw like the claws at the, at the end of its legs just like two black prongs and uh, I had you know fangs and I remember it had black eyes like it would with like a person up front but then the eyes it had one right here one right there and one right there and it was like bald but it had like a tuft of hair black wiry hair on top and it was just staring at, uh, at the wall in front of it almost like a spider it was motionless it didn't look at me I, I, I've had a feeling it could see me though because it had eyes on the side of its head and then uh, they picked me up again and drug me into the room next door and I remember one of them. They were Satanists, I found out later. They were all wearing black robes and stuff. And one of the Satanists said, uh, let's just feed him the Max. And another one said, no, we're going to find out what Aquino wants to do to him first. And I found out later from uh, Robert, the XO, that uh, they named it Max. And I, I said, why did they do that? And he told me that it was like uh, building ships in a bottle to reptiles and greys and stuff like that. It's like a way to occupy their time. They just It's just like a way to, it's like a hobby for them. And he said they live underground all the time and they don't really get to do very much. So, you know, built, making these things is, is a way to occupy their time. Going back to the kids in the cages, the underground bases. Um, it was one of the memories I had whenever, before I got out of the military, you, you, you go through this process where you talk to the master chief of the base. And he was an off-world German. And uh, you talk to the XO, the executive officer, and then you talk to the CEO. So I talked to the master chief, and I didn't really. I thought he was kind of a, I don't know, a jerk. But uh, then I went to the XO, and the, it turned out the XO knew me in this past life, was very good friends with me. He told me he was, I was like a son to him. Um, and it was one of the memories I had was I remember just seeing these kids in cages. And I kept on saying to him, I said, Robert, I said, Robert, what were the kids for? And he kept on trying to change the subject. And I said, what were the kids for? What were the kids for? And eventually he broke down and he said, yeah, have you ever seen Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas? And I said, yeah. And I don't know, that movie was a couple years, eh, a few years, probably five years old by this time. And uh, I said, yeah. And he said, remember the adrenochrome scene? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, that's where they get it from. They get it from children in underground bases. Or actually below the bases in the caverns in the earth. And I remember I said, you know, I remember the guy in the movie said he got it from a Satanist. He said, yeah, Satanists sell it. And then he started telling me, like, uh, Tom Cruise was here. And I remember the guys on base were like, yeah, Tom Cruise was here. And everybody was like, what the hell? Why was Tom Cruise here? And I remember one of my friends said, yeah, they let him in the underground base. And I was like, I've only been in the underground base once. You know, like, why did they leave him in there? And he said, I have no, I don't know. And then Robert told me that he was the main distributor for a, a Scientologist for Adrenochrome. He told me that Tom Hanks was pretty much like the, the kingpin of Adrenochrome. He told me that he was caught in uh, that whole thing with Australia where they, they said he got the uh, coronavirus. They said they got him there. He was I guess he was trying to uh, flee to the underground caverns. I guess he was that close you know, to the Satanists and the reptiles where he could have got, you know some sort of safe passage or immunity or something but they got him before he got underground and they executed him right then and there in australia they tried him and they executed him and yeah he told me that uh all this stuff you're going to be seeing with him on tv and stuff that's his brother he said his brother sounds just like him and they have something called uh what is that deep fake he told me about deep fake technology and this was in what 2005 because it was already two years so i got to this command in 2003 and i got out in 2005 and I said, what's that? And he said, they have this technology where they can put someone else's face on you. And I said, you mean so somebody can rob a bank and, you know, they can just steal their identity and you think it's you because it's on the film? And he said, yeah. And I said, it's scary that they have technology like that in the future. He said, we have technology like that now. And, uh, yeah, he's just, yeah, kind of telling me all that. And, uh, but I, I, I went on and I said, what are the kids for? And he said, they told me about the adrenochrome. He said, uh, they take a syringe, he said, at the base of the skull. It's almost like a spinal tap. And uh, 
they drain a pint or two of uh, blood out. Oh, he said first they electrify the cages. I guess the cages are hooked up to like electricity. They shock the kids till they pass out. And that causes the adrenaline to kick in. And then they take them out, strap them to a table, put kind of like the spinal tap at the base of the skull, extract the adrenochrome one or two pints at a time. And I said, I remember some of those kids were only like five or six years old, maybe younger toddlers. I said, a pint of blood, that would kill, you know, a toddler. And he says, it does. And he said, uh, they grind them up in something that looks similar to a wood chipper and they feed them to the other children. And I guess that's what they eat. And yeah, I remember he, I told him about the girl. I said, I remember the girl uh, slamming her hands on the cage. And he said, uh, she would have attacked you if she was out. He said, because they're feral. They don't know how to speak. They've never been held. They're very, they're just feral animals. And, uh, yeah, I remember um, very pale white children. And I remember he told me that, that they get them from the mines of the moon, that that's the main thing for the brothels in the mines of the moon. Is uh, They take a lot of, they take most of those babies, just walk them through a portal. I guess after the mother nurses them a certain amount of time, they can live on their own. Walk them through a portal, and then they put them in these underground caverns under the, under the underground bases. And... Uh, the whole time travel thing is so abstract. I mean, some of these could be my kids because I slept with some of the women on the moon and stuff like that. So, yeah, of course. But uh, later on in my story, whenever I told that Satanist, the, the female, when I told her I, I killed her and the other one, and uh, she was going on about, but they weren't your children. Why do you care? I was talking about, I was like, well, you, I kind of told her she deserved it because well, she harvested children. And uh, she said, well, they're not your children. What do you care? And uh, when I said, though, they are my children, I slept with the honeypots, which is what they, they call the, the brothel women. I know what honeypots are in the sense of uh, blackmailing, stuff like that. But I remember the Germans calling the women honeypots, the off-world Germans in the moon. And they called the men, I think they called them meat sacks. They called the men meat sacks, and they called the women uh, honeypots. And... Uh, yeah, so whenever I did say, you know, those are my children, I, I don't know if I really meant it in the sense that they are directly, you know, my children, but I meant it in the sense that, you know, we all came from the same world, and I, I felt kinship with them in a sense. I mean, I felt pity for them, of course, seeing I feel pity for, you know, a dog locked up in a dog kennel its entire life. So going back to Max... The, uh, spy the spider hybrid, the chimera in the cage. I remember I asked Robert, you know, why do they do that? He's, I, 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 I said, well, yeah, what is it? And he said the reptiles made them, make them and the greys make them. And they, they said it's just a way of, you know, boredom. It's, it's, ship, it's like building ships in a bottle to them. It's like building models. It's just a way to take up time. And I asked him if, I, I remember even asking him, uh, is it intelligent? And he said somewhat. And I said, how? He said, about 65 IQ is what he, you know, gauged it. But I don't remember any kind of communication with it. It just stared straight ahead, like at the wall in front of it, just like a spider would. It was, it was just motionless. It didn't move. I couldn't even really see it breathing, I don't think. It was just completely motionless the way a spider would be. I remember Robert told me their name, and that was a big reason why. Something about getting your mind wiped or whatever, it really, it takes away names from you. Faces are even hard for me to pinpoint. I can remember situations that happened, just things that would happen in my day-to-day -day life. And I remember I asked Robert, I said, you know, because one of the Satanists, I used to drink in the bar on base, and the Satanists would always be there. And I remember I was there because they would, talk, they would say things about me. They would talk about almost like how I had a life that I didn't know I had. And, you know, I... It, you're king of the Tajidans, eh? That's what you said the other day. He's like, yeah, Aquino was fucking you up. And you were saying that. And he's like, ah, Aquino believed you, but I didn't believe you. He was just, I call him the goon. I don't remember his name. He was just this big, he had a shaved head. And he was just this big guy. And he was a Satanist. And he was the one that usually talked to me. And I remember the other guys who was at the bar. And they were, they were the Satanists, like, in the background wearing cloaks. And I really didn't get to see their face. And they said, uh, you know, stop telling him that, you know. He's, you're not supposed to say things like that to him and things like that. And he said, ah, he likes it. That's why he comes here. And it's, it's pretty much why I came there is because he was just, it was weird. It was just, 
I had no memory of it, and they're telling me about it. But yeah, I remember he said that he asked me if I ever heard of Billy Meyer, and that was big at the time. And I, I said no. I, I really w- didn't care about any kind of UFO or sci-fi or anything like that. And I said, uh, he said, yeah, Billy Meyer, and he talked about that. And a little while later, I got a, my own computer. I got my first computer back then. And I looked up Billy Meyer, and I looked up uh, Pleiadians and things like that. So whenever I was leaving the command, and I, I had images of what these people looked like in my head still. I had blonde hair, and usually blue eyes, usually blonde hair, sometimes red or brown, but usually blonde. Eyes were a little bigger than ours. Foreheads seemed to be a little higher. Um, I remember I said to Robert, I, I said, they're the Pleiadians, right, aren't they? And he said, he said, we call them Nordics. I guess the military calls them Nordics. And I said, well, what do they call themselves? And he said, uh, Tajitans, Tajetans, again. And uh, I remember that. And uh, I remember grabbing like a post-it note off his desk and like a pen. I was like shuffling around this, you know, $10,000 mahogany desk that XOs and COs have in the military and he asked me, like, what are you doing? And I, I said, I'm looking for a pen. And he gave me a pen. And I started writing all this stuff down that he was telling me. And I I read it for days or months. And I, it was just too much for me. And I had to let it go. I had to throw it away. I couldn't read this every day. It was going to destroy me, as he said. And uh, I remember being on the ship with him. And one of them was called Leader, the man. And he was a warrior cast. They have, like, a warrior cast. Males. And uh, I remember I even asked him, I said, what do you, what do you call yourselves? And he said, uh, Tajitans. 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 And I said, can you say that out loud for me? And he said it out loud. And then he asked me, why did, I, why did I ask to say it out loud? And I said to him, speaking out loud was the way I communicated most of my life, you know, as a kid. So it's just a way for us to remember things more when we say it out loud to ourselves. So you didn't understand why I wanted that. When I first joined up the 20 year and back, I... Uh, I, well, I was taken to something called a density chamber. Um, I was taken by a reptile. I remember Robert told me before he left, he said, you're going to be escorted by a reptile, and he's big. I didn't realize how big it was going to be. And It was about nine and, he, nine and a half feet tall. It wore one of those skin-tight, like, blue blue uniforms. And uh, it was this huge. It's probably about nine and a half feet tall, brown, had, like, alligator eyes. I remember it kind of had ridges going down its head, like mohawks going down flat face had a mouth that went all the way across and then went up um and it took me to uh something called a density chamber i had no idea what it was i I never saw it and uh it had one of those airtight doors and it had a chair in it with holes with straps and i thought it was a gas chamber or something i thought it was an execution chamber i thought they were trying to kill me so i tried to run it grabbed me threw me back in the chair um I was trying to just get away, doing everything I could. I was pulling its thumb, you know, it grabbed my hand, and I remember grabbing its thumb and trying to pull, get it off of me. And it headbutted me, and I knocked out, and I, I came to, and I had more straps attached. So I tried to get off again, and I, I remember it grabbed me, and it, like, it like hit, put its palm on my chest and just pushed me right back into the chair. And I remember its fingers were, like, here. I could feel its palm here as well. And uh, it did almost like that alligator kind of mating call where – it's a, a deep frequency rumble where you can't hear it, but you can just feel it in your chest. It's almost like a percussion, the rumble. And uh, as it got, it did that at first, and it leaned in close to me, and then I could hear the rumble like audio, and then a, like a growl almost, like a reptile growl. And it said, don't make me hit you again. And as well, soon as it got close enough, I gouged its eye with my thumb. And because uh, it was just like a fight or flight thing. And uh, I was punished for that. I was supposed to go directly to a ship, but then they punished me for that. Um, they were going to give me, I think, 40 years. I remember Robert said, he said, they were going to give you 40 years on the mind of the moon. And something that they do to people, uh, like, I guess what I did was considered, you know, a, a horror defense. But, uh, you know, high-ranking officers or politicians and things like that. They'll, they'll, they'll actually put people in the minds of the moon as punishment if, you know, if they murder their kid or something like that or did them wrong. It's usually for something really, really bad due to another person. But he, they get, they'll give you 40 years 
they'll age regress you and they'll send you back in time 40 years, but they don't wipe your mind. And uh, most people uh, commit suicide within like six months when they still have, you know, memories like that of the 20 year and back. Yeah, as far as what the reptile looked like, he had a flat face. He had gold slitted eyes like a like an alligator. He was very dark brown, so dark that I, it was kind of hard to see him, like this, the details in his face. I remember ridges going down his head. I remember the mouth going straight across and up. Um, just huge, nine and a half feet tall, but muscle-wise, he was just unbelievably sh- strong looking. The chair, the density uh, chamber... What that's for, I remember the night before it happened that I volunteered for this. I remember, I don't know if I was in the lounge at the barracks. I think I was in the TV lounge area. And there was a door open across the hall and there was this guy talking about, it was almost like he wanted me to overhear him. And he was kind of like getting me ready for what was going to happen. He said, you're going to be escorted. You're going to be strapped to this chair and it's called a density chamber. He said, because we're only third density and uh, ETs that we work with, majority of them are fifth density. He said, once you go up in the fifth density, you'll become faster, stronger. Your IQ will go up 200 points about. He said, you'll become more of a collective. Like when you're in a group of people, you kind of become that group. And he was almost like he was telling me this stuff. And I remember when I came back after the 20 year and back and, uh, you know, after gouging this thing in the eye and getting tortured for days by Kino. I remember hearing him say in this open room, acting as though he was talking to another person. Maybe he was. He said uh, he wasn't ready yet. I remember him saying that. He was almost like my guide or something. I don't know what you want to call it. But I remember even ta- talking to Robert and telling him about, like, me hearing about this stuff. Me hearing about the guys talk about reptiles, underground bases, and things like that. And I remember I said, was that a way to kind of like condition me to get me ready to do this? And he said, yeah, that was intentional. They were doing that intentional to, to get you ready. And, uh, but yeah, that was as far as the reptile I, I can remember. And the density uh, chamber. I remember I asked Robert, I said, why does it have that? I, he asked me, why did you do that? He's like, why would you ever do that? Why would you poke it in the eye? And he said that, uh, I said, because it looked like a gas chamber. And he said the sealed door was... Uh, it has to build up pressure, I guess, to artificially push you up into the fifth density. And also so the density doesn't leak out and affect the people outside of this machine, this density chamber. I don't remember them having technology, knowing whether or not I would be a problem in the future. But there is like abilities where they call it looking down one's, uh, the, looking down your timeline. They have a lot of Fifth density is less like Star Trek and more like Star Wars, except everybody knows how to use the Force, like a little bit. Like most ETs, they know. They can predict the future somewhat accurately. But, and it's weird when you're fifth density. I remember, it's not just, I think it's less about getting your mind wiped and more about just living in that kind of different reality. I remember feeling as though, I would be sometimes sometimes swimming into the future and then going back to the present, like not swishing back and forth, not really know, like, am I here or am I like five years from now? I remember having that feeling sometimes. I remember being with like a group of people. If you're only with like maybe say two or three other people, then yeah, you're more of like an individual. But if you're with like five or six people, you're kind of just swimming in each other's thoughts. It gets to a point where you really don't know which thoughts are yours and which thoughts are theirs. Um, so yeah, you become much more of a collective. It's like you become more of like the group you're, you're a part of. Well, talking about the super soldier, whenever I remember, well, Robert told me about that and it wasn't, I don't know. I I think he said that that's like what they call you like in the dark fleet or or what you can be called like a super soldier because they soup you up so much. They, they make you very big and, uh, muscular and things like that. They just affect everything you don't have to work out or anything i don't know your testosterone goes up i remember i have very thick hair i remember my hairline receding when i was in the dark fleet because i think my testosterone was just so high i remember like my hair kind of going back um but yeah um as far as what robert said he only knew about uh super soldier talk because he knew that i was going to do an interview on super soldier talk because he was looking down my timeline he was like yeah the first thing you're gonna do you're gonna do something called super soldier talk and he was just talking about all these different things i was i would do in the future and things like that yeah i mean he told me just told me 
that I would have a really hard time, and I did, for a long period of my life. He said, you know, you're just going to be, you know. I was pretty much homeless, couch surf, surfing, my drinking got out of hand, things like that. But uh, and then he told me it would get better, but it would take a long time, and it did. And uh, for the longest time, I didn't remember having this conversation with him. I don't remember talking about this. It was just something that was so... He told me this would destroy you. He said, if you don't get your mind rewiped, this will destroy you. And he kept on saying that. Robert did. And I said, like, what do you mean? Eventually, I said, what do you mean destroy me? I was like, am I going to just blow up or, con- I don't know, you know, going to combust? And he said that most people uh, commit suicide within the first six months if they have memories of the 20-year impact. And that's what he meant by destroy you. And the reason he looked down my timeline and how why it was so important for him is he wanted to make sure that I didn't commit suicide. And I remember he got to a point maybe a year out from where he was looking through my timeline. And he goes, well, you make it. And he was kind of happy about that. And he's like, but it's hard. He said, it's going to be very hard for you. And I remember that. As far as the SSP disclosure coming out to the public, I mean, there were things I was told, but I was, like I said, I, I don't want to go get involved, get too deep into it, but I th- believe he was saying that, yeah, some of these things are going to be exposed eventually, but he says it has to be very, it has to be done very slowly through the public. Like he told me about the- Chrome episode, the Q and a Chrome episode on uh, South Park. I remember that, and he said, uh, "Do you know the guys from Parker uh, South Park?" I said, "Yeah, Trey Parker and Matt Stone." And he goes, "Yeah." He's like, "Remember when they uh, went to the Oscars?" I said, "Yeah." I said, "They were on acid and they went and drag." And he laughed and he said, "Yeah." He said, "That's because they hate them." And I said, "Who?" And he said, "Hollywood." He said, "He said they hate them." And I said, why? He said, because they, they know what they are. And I said, well, I said, what are they? He said, they're just scum. He said, they're all scum. And he told me that the Chrome episode, he told me that the military approached them personally, like the good guys in the military, and said and asked them, gave them like a roundabout script of what they wanted to be disclosed, and just let them work around and fill in all the jokes and everything else. But he said, he, he called it a soft disclosure. He said that those... Two episodes, the Q and the Crone episode of South Park was something he called soft disclosure. And he said that that's how it's going to have to be brought to the public because if we just start bringing secret space programs and a lot of Hollywood and politicians are, you know, files and pretty much cannibals with the adrenochrome and everything else, that the public just won't be able to accept it. And, uh, you know, the suicide would just go through the roof and it would just be a near end of the world kind of thing. People would just lose their minds. So it has to be done very, very slow, meticulous. And that's why this seems so painful and so drug drug out is because this has to be slow because the people just won't be able to accept it. And uh, I asked about, I remember I asked about Ascension because that was brought up, whether we'd ever make it to fifth density. And he really didn't want to go into that. I don't know. He, it, this, it didn't seem important to him. He, it, what he felt was more important was he said that all these technologies were going to be brought to the public. He was almost like in tears. He was so proud of himself. He was, it's going to be so good. You don't know how good it's going to be. You know, med beds are going to come out to the public. All the, he says we're going to get rid of you know childhood deformities, the cancer, and leukemia, and all these things are going to be a thing of the past and. He told me that the economy is going to be better than the 50s. Everybody's going to have a job, you know. And just everybody's going to be able to take great vacations. And yeah, he just told me that the money is just going to be ridiculous. Like, you know, we're not going to have to worry about making ends meet anymore is how he kind of put it. And then he he, he asked me, he said, uh, where do you think the world's gold is uh, stored? And uh, I was living in England at the time, and I, I went to, you know, London and stuff. And I, I said, well, the Bank of London, the Bank of England, that's what I figured. And he told me it was in the catacombs of the Vatican. And uh, he said, it's just there. And I remember, I said, like, is it being guarded? And he was like, well, there's like a basement hatch door in the Vatican, and that's guarded. But that's it. He's like, you just walk in, and there's just miles and miles and miles of gold just all in, into the, uh, in the catacombs. 
And uh, yeah, he told me the catacombs were filled with reptiles and elongated skulls were primarily in the, the, those catacombs. And uh, yeah, but I mean, he in general, he was just talking about how great it's going to be, how just our future is going to be very good, not just health wise, but, you know, economic as well. Crocodiles now to reptilians? No, flat. Yeah, reptilians. Yeah, they have the they have uh, the well the one I saw this very first one I saw had a flat and you know a mouth that went straight across and then up and then they don't have muscles in their face at least like the full blooded ones I remember so it's like uh, they don't bare their teeth when they're mad or they don't furrow their brows it's just the only way you can tell they're mad at you is their eyes get small and they, they they'll squint at you when they're irritated with you. I remember that. But I remember the ones on the ship when I was in the Dark Fleet, they look similar to a Skeksis, but reptile-like. Hunchback, they wore robes that drug behind them, or I'm guessing that concealed their tail. I remember the robes would, uh, they look like they had like, I don't know, hieroglyphics on them or something, or runes. But they almost shimmered and kind of moved in a way where they almost seemed like there was holograms coming out of them. It was almost like it, it, it looked like a, a mix between scales just being on the not actual scales, but scales being embroidered or whatever into the material, but also just like hieroglyphics as well. And it, it seemed to shift and phase and move. And I remember you could just stare at them almost and get hypnotized by them almost the way you get like hypnotized by a fire. Just at, like look, look, looking at these things, robes. But then, like I said, I saw a Kino. I remember one of the guys on base told me that uh, just out of the blue, he said, uh, "Hey, Daryl, you know Johnson or whatever the guy's name told me that there's some kind of machine where they can extract a soul out of your body, but and then, uh, but it has to be done before puberty for some reason. But it can't be done too young, like two or three, because the body's mostly sedentary, so the body would die. It'd be too young." The bones have become too brittle. So they have to wait till they're about nine or ten and they can track the consciousness out of this body. And then it can be something else can go into it, almost like an astral projection of this body or something. And uh, he told me that's what happened to Aquino. I said, well, what happened to the original soul? He said, I don't know. That, that kind of freaked me out. But yeah, I got to see Aquino and that's exactly what it was. It was some sort of like... He told me he was a native inhabitant of Earth, but he was like a reptile. He told me that he was once worshipped in Egypt, ancient Egypt. And uh, he looked like a snake pretty much. He looked like a snake's head coming out of like, he wore a hood, like a red hood with a red robe. I think there might have been like runes or hieroglyphics kind of like around the robe, around the hood. But yeah, he looked pretty much like a snake guy. And he told me he was pure black. He had very like big thick scales like in the sense that they were kind of like lumpy he kind of looked almost lumpy he had like these big scales all over him and uh he was shiny black like like uh like onyx he was almost like a mirror he was so shiny black and i remember i asked him things like do you shed and that was insulting to him he said no i don't shed because i told him he looked like a freshly shed snake and uh, i asked him to take off his hood so i could see get a better look at him and he said no and he was very obsessed with me calling him sir it was almost weird. He was almost more like a, seemed like he almost had like a personality disorder, this reptile where he thought he was a Kino. Like he seemed to think like he was more Kino than he was whatever this reptile was. And uh, like I said, whenever you get out of the uh, process of uh, being pushed back down to the third density, it's like you go through almost like a, like an amnesia. The last thing I think I can remember at the time was being picked up from the airport by a first class petty officer and going to McDonald's in uh, Newquay, England. I think that's like the first thing I remember. And then all of a sudden, like I'm being tortured by like these snake monsters or whatever, these reptile things. And there's like guys in black cloaks in this room. And uh, so I really didn't know what was happening. So I wasn't calling him sir. I was just, I don't know what I was thinking, but it was weird. It was this, he kept on wanting me to refer to him as a, as an army officer. And it was like, it was like, he kind of thought he was more Aquino than he thought whatever he was. I'm not really sure how to explain it. When I went to the moon, um, yeah, I went there as punishment in the mines of the moon. And I remember I asked Robert before I got out, I wanted like a timeline or something. I said, uh, I remember being mines 
I said, was that on Earth? He said, that was on the moon. I said, it was on the moon? He said, you were on Mars, too. I said, well, when, was, when was I on Mars? He goes, in the dark fleet. I said, and then the rest of the time I was the solar warden, he said, you were with them. And then that's when I brought up, you know, the, the Pleiadians. He said, we call them Nordics. I said, what do you call themselves? Like Edens. And then, uh, yeah. So, but he told me I was three months in the mines of the moon, two years in the dark fleet, and the rest of the time I was with them. And in the moon, I remember, um, I remember one time uh, there were Germans and reptiles on the moon. Maybe some grays here and there, the tall ones, tall whites or whatever, tall, like the big tall grays. And uh, I remember like a group of women being like pushed around or something like that by Germans. And they were like crying. And then uh, I remember one of the Germans saying, get, get those honey pots up there. And that's why I remember like that word honey pot. And... Uh, but yeah, on the Minds of the Moon, you work in groups of, I don't know, five or six or so. And if somebody in the group wasn't working hard enough or whatever, they had uh, these shock collars on you and they would shock you. Like it was like a group kind of punishment for one, if one guy messed up. And uh, I remember there was actually a guy on base. I didn't really know him, know him, but he was one of the ones that talked about being on the Minds of the Moon and how great it was and stuff. And I remember he was in my group, and uh, one of the, one of the guys just refused to work. And I remember um, we would take breaks. I guess you know we would work so long we would take breaks just in the mines, and we would just fall asleep on the ground. And uh, this guy that refused to work, this man I knew on base who taught, who had memories of the twenty year back himself, he uh, wound up killing this guy with a rock because the guy just refused to work and we just kept on getting shocked because of them and i remember robert coming to the mines of the moon I, I was just working i didn't remember him at the time or knew who he was and i remember he went to one of the germans and he was talking to him and then the same german he came up to me and he had some sort of device like a box or something and he kind of like waved it over me and then there was a german that really hated my guts um he was the one, he was good friends, I guess, with the reptile that I poked in the eye. And he was actually a first class petty officer in the Navy. And uh, I remember um, I took a biology 101 on this base. And I remember him w walking like right up to me and just glaring at me like he hated my guts. And I had no idea why. And uh, yeah, he was an off world German. There were uh, the doc on base was an off world German, the doctor, lieutenant. Uh, we had a senior chief that was an uh, off-world German. The master chief of the base was an off-world German. The S3, which is like the legal officer, he was actually on my ship. Robert told me that um, in the Dark Fleet. He was in the Dark Fleet. And, uh, yeah, so well, being on the moon, um, we were underground the whole time. I don't remember there being any breathable air because we were underground the whole time. Even where we lived was underground. There was almost like a, it looked almost like a condo kind of thing where you would live in the moon. And uh, um, I remember, I don't remember anything, any native species or native plants growing there. It seemed kind of dead. I remember it was cold and uh, just being underground and you were always covered in like dust, white dust. And I remember that we used drill bits almost like a, uh, you know, what are they called? Roughnecks or leathernecks? The, the guys who drill for oil, where you just put like a big piece on, you'd ho hook it up to another so it could, it could drill deeper and deeper. And sometimes it would just be in front of you. I, I believe in mines, like on Earth, they have things like that where it's just just a huge bit and it just, you just kind of guide it in and it just drills right through the Earth. And then as it goes deeper, you have to keep on adding more and more pieces to it as it goes deeper and deeper. But as far as what we mined, I don't remember. I mean, maybe, maybe it was like titanium or something. I don't think the, I think the mines of the moon were more for punishment, but also more to get babies for uh, adrenochrome harvesting as a way to just get children that were completely untraceable where people didn't even know they existed. And I think that's probably what it was for. And I, I think I remember them taking, you know, 
young children away from the women and stuff like that and them crying it was very i don't know it was a very slave mentality it was just a very slave world when i was on the moon I'm, i mean yeah i'm sure i had kids i was mostly with a woman though that a nurse the first woman i met she was actually on my base too her, her name was uh her, name, her first name was april and uh she was on the base that i worked at and uh I mean, I'm sure I had some kids, and uh, hopefully, maybe they had high enough scores to where, you know, high IQ scores means a lot. It seems like that to ETs and things like that, to be able to interact with their technology and all this other stuff. So, hopefully, I did have kids that, you know, made it. They weren't just used as adrenochrome, but I'm sure I probably did have some. But, I mean, at the time, you really didn't – that was your only motivation to work was just sex. You really didn't – you got fed. You didn't get money. There was no leisure time or anything like that. They, you just got time to, like, go to this brothel kind of area. And that was your – that was your payment. That seems like, you know, it, you know. The brothel was kind of, like, a lot – like, in the moon, even the apartments, it seemed like, you know, the apartments weren't – it's, there just wasn't a building in the middle of the moon. It was like built. It was like three, four walls. You know, it's one in front of you, one on the sides, and, and there were railings. And there, you know, there were like five, five levels, and it was like apartments or condos. So it was like that. So the brothel, I remember, um, it was just kind of like you walked up, and there were just like these levels. Um, you know, first floor, second floor. But there were no walls or nothing like that. So you could just see the women. You just looked up and you could just see like these women and stuff like that there. And I remember maybe they did kind of do corny stuff or something like that. You know, like, I don't know. <laughs> Brothels like you would have like in the Wild West where they would be like, you know, hi boys or something like that. And they'd wave at you and stuff like that. Yeah, you could just see them. Yeah, and you'd walk up and then, you you know, you'd walk in and you'd go up like these lifts and stuff like that and i remember there was almost like there was a heavy set woman and she was almost like a uh like the madam she was like in charge of them all it was like an older like heavy set woman and she was like the madam i remember that yeah i mean as far as holograms and stuff being on i don't remember that but i remember yeah there were beds uh, drinking i don't remember very much drinking because that would have caused you know fights and problems and revolts i'm sure they didn't want you being drunk all the time but uh, i don't remember drinking i remember being in the dark fleet um you were like you were given like a stipend almost like a little bit of money and uh I, I made enough i don't remember exactly how much i made but it was enough to buy like two large like german pints of beer like you know the very large like steins of beer and uh yeah so they would give you beer. They would give you a lot. But you, you could get stuff like sugar, honey, coffee, tea, chocolate, and beer. Things like that. It was like little extras you could get. Well, I remember like being in Solar Warden. And uh, yeah, we had a lot of imports. I remember that. I remember I remember. Um, number one was chocolate. Like uh, Baker's chocolate. Unsweetened. Just blocks. You would see boxes that would just say cocoa. And I remember... Uh, Beer was probably number two. Heineken was, like, really popular. Um, children's clothing was a big one. I remember seeing boxes that said, like, Old Navy Kids, Gap Kids, things like that. Because most of the stuff, it wasn't for their kids, but most of the stuff out there is only, like, a foot or two tall. You really don't see... When you go, when you get, go into an environment where there's you just see many ets from many different worlds and stuff like that um, a majority of the ones that you see are very small like only like a foot or maybe two feet high so and they they mostly just wear robes and i guess they just don't think about their fashion or anything like that and they like the way we dress so they'll actually wear like children's clothing and stuff like that because they're so small but i remember that yeah was it chocolate beer and children's clothing those are probably like the top three things that we would see because in solar warden it was almost like we were kind of like uh you know, customs almost for Earth. If anything was coming in or coming out, they would have to inspect it first and things like that. And then Solar Warden got to a point where nothing was allowed in or out once this whole war was declared or this independence was declared. And I think that's, we're going through the ending phases of that right now. And I remember uh, 
a shooting down craft, trying to get away. I remember Robert telling me about it. I remember him saying, like, uh, they're scared. They're trying to get away. He told me that you would see things like uh, strange comets with, uh, like, maybe gold or silver sparks coming out of them. And they would say it was things like uh, space debris. But he said a lot of times it would just be their ships being shot down. And that's what we were seeing. Well, in the Dark Fleet, they really didn't explain anything to you. Um, it was almost like having a real job in the sense that some people said that the war, the Earth was dead, that there was a war, that nobody could ever inhabit it again, or maybe for a thousand years or ten thousand years. Or it was almost like having a real job. It seemed like people would just tell you different things just to confuse you more. As far as movies or contraband, I remember the Germans. I think they did like Disney movies. I remember they did. I would talk about Disney movies. I got to a point with the Germans where I started playing guitar for them. And I started playing in their own bar. They had like a little bar on the ship. And uh, yeah, because I was able to play a musical instrument and I was playing for them, I got all access to uh, the music on the ship. So I was listening to all this different music and I was looking at the covers and it reminded me of like my parents. So I listened to music that my parents listened to because I, I still didn't really have memory exactly in my mind but it was almost like i i feel close to this album cover I, I i think my parents listened to this or something so i'm gonna listen to this and i remember guys coming up to me, like uh, twice i think two different times um guys coming up to me and trying to bribe me for uh music and things like that as far as just what i had access to maybe just like top 40 and things like that but yeah they would try to give me um you know like i said you you get a certain amount of money just to buy little extras on the side and they i think they were willing to give me like pretty much what i would have made in five years the first time and then what i would have made in like a decade the second time so uh, the, it was the other guys that were like me they called this uh conscripts i believe which is short for conscriptions like volunteers and uh other guys like me they didn't have access i think they could listen to like classical maybe and that was about it but nothing like rock or rap or pop or nothing like that and yeah, they tried to bribe me for that, but I didn't want to lose my privileges, so I said no. But yeah, I remember that was kind of like an underground thing. I still had access to all the music, yeah, through the smart glass pad and whatever they had the ship's computer had as far as music. And it had everything. And I remember looking at the smart glass pad, which was just like a you know rectangular glass pad. And yeah, you could see like the album cover of the music. It looked almost like a Spotify kind of thing. You know, you, got the, you could see all the music and all that stuff and all the tracks and yeah, it was just on your smart glass pad. The bar on the in the Dark Fleet ship, it was a, a horseshoe bar, you know, one like that. And only women sat at the bar. I remember that. They had women, German women, and they were mostly like nurses and things like that. They kind of had more traditional roles. And uh, the, there were, I think, four or five round tables with about four or five seats on each table. And that's where the men sat. And I remember they would pull up their table so they could get closer to me, and they all sat down and... I remember um, there was a bartender and uh, the Germans would usually buy me like a, a pint or two of beer every time I played. And uh, they spoke English in front of me. They would usually speak German, but since I was there, it was almost like a respect thing. It was kind of interesting. They, they would speak English in front of me and they would talk. And I remember they would do things like they would, you know, you're... They would slap their thighs, just like a German, you know, when they think something's funny. Instead of clapping their hands, they, they would have, like, those kind of mannerisms and things like that. And, uh, yeah, they just wore, you know, it looked like a, like a Gestapo uniform, almost like, like a black uniform. And, yeah, I remember the only one that would talk German in front of me probably was the captain. But I don't really think any of them really liked the captain very much. But, yeah, besides that, all of them were very nice and polite. To me, I remember. I got to a point, I remember, where uh, I think I got too uh, cocky or something. And uh, there was this one German woman, and I liked her, and I thought she was pretty. She was a nurse. And I remember uh, whenever you had a major injury, I really didn't suffer that many injuries. Most of my injuries were from the reptiles because I either didn't want to do something or I didn't do it properly and they would torture you and things like that. And then they would put you in a med bed or a healing tank and they'd fix you up. 
But then you always got like the human touch. There was always like a nurse that would actually do an actual physical to make sure you were fine before you were allowed to be checked out. And it was this German woman that sat at the bar. And I remember she was checking me out one time as far as like a physical. And uh, she said, you can look at me, you know. And I, I explained to her that if I was to anger you or upset you, she could just say anything. She could say, you know he made a pass at me or he tried to kiss me and I would be in a lot of trouble. I would be tortured for, that would be a big deal because they didn't want you doing that at all. And I remember that. I remember being at the bar and I got good into piano. I started playing a little bit of piano. I started getting into the violin flute, but this was, I, at first I got into a piano after guitar and, uh, I was playing a, a song. I remember the Germans like Elton John. <laughs> songs i remember being at the quarter deck and one of the one of the germans who was a chief a senior chief said uh he was talking to another i think a lieutenant officer he's probably another german he's like yeah you like that song he was talking about i don't know uh, oh he's just talking about elton john songs like, yeah i like him and the guy said you know he's gay right it's like oh no he's not things like that and then i remember the german came up to me and he said uh do you like elton john I was like, yeah, he's all right. He's like, really? He was like, ah. And he was just kind of like coming up to me like, hey, you were the guy that used to play piano. And I remember he was also the same guy whenever I first got back. He saw me and he goes, and he was this German. I think he was a senior chief of glasses. He hated me too. He was skinny. And I remember him saying something like, oh, he's supposed to, I thought he was supposed to be with us now. Like he couldn't figure out like why I was back. I was supposed to join the Dark Fleet. And, uh, but yeah, when I was this. I was playing piano and I was singing and I was making eye contact with this German woman at the bar and her friends started laughing and they were like giggling and like laughing and it really pissed off the uh, captain. And I remember he took us both outside and uh, like out in the hall, out away from the bar and he was just like yelling at us both. And, uh, you know, in the bar in the dark fleet, um, I, I remember Robert saying when I did join the Dark Fleet that they weren't going to accept me because I was only, I think, 8% German or something like that. He said, you're mostly Welsh. And uh, as far as the way that women dressed, I think it was almost like kind of like a white, not really scrubs, but scrub looking, almost like a nurse kind of garb, but just a white kind of. undefined kind of like just a white v-neck like a you know just like like a scrub but i think they had almost they had a dress uniform too which was similar to like the dark fleet i think maybe a dress instead of slacks or something like that but something very similar to like a dark fleet uniform but uh i'm sure they i mean they knew i was american the germans and uh, they knew where i came from they, they kept tabs on you they knew what base you came from or what part what country what command um, I don't remember them being, I remember they calling us mongrels. I remember us being called mongrels. So maybe that was like a, a racist thing. Yeah. I remember playing guitar and I remember, uh, right by the door, there would be like a warrior cast kind of reptile, like the dark brown kind. And I remember them just maybe one or two of them and they would lean up against the wall and just listen to me play. They were interested. And then I remember um, the second in command, like the first officer who was a German, I became good friends with him. And uh, he said that the uh, master, which is what they call the, the head reptile, he said the master wants you to play for them. And it was the head reptile and he had two other like lackeys. There was like three, three reptiles that were on the ship. And they were kind of like the supreme leaders of the ship. And uh, yeah, I, I, said, I, I said, I'm not going to do that. And I remember he said... Something like, well, you know, well, let's go down there right now. And you can tell him to his face that you refuse to play for him. And I said, well, I'm not going to do that. And I said, so what should I do? Because there's always this, this very subservient kind of behavior you have to have with the reptiles. And I said, well, I'm meaning, you know, do, does it want me to cower and bow and everything like that? He said, no, you just have to sit there and you have to play guitar. That's all they want. And I said, okay. And I played, I think it was like some sort of Bach I played. And... I don't know, maybe a half hour, 45 minutes I played for them. And they just listened. And after it was done, I just sat on my chair with the guitar and I just bowed with the, gu the guitar in my lap. And that was the end. They just got up and left. 
And that's one thing about ETs, whether they're positive or negative, they really have a love for our music and they really don't have like a concept of uh, harmony and melody like us. But classical art, classical music, they like all that stuff. There were always reptiles on the ship, but not just the, like the, the upper royal class, but the warrior caste. The Germans, as far as what I took, the off-world Germans, the Dark Fleet, they're like a... Uh, what do you call that a vassal state it seems like for like the draconian empire or whatever you want to call it it seems like they're almost like a it seemed like the germans i guess i i remember hearing things about like the real society channelers and stuff like that who were they were trying to find et tech the germans and uh i think the germans at that early moment in the you know, 30s and 40s found out that uh how much the reptiles and ETs are really do uh, influence Earth and how much we really are slaves to them. So I guess they figured out that they figured that they'd rather be a vassal state to the reptiles instead of slaves like the rest of us that have some sort of freedom. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I remember whenever I went to their world and I, I ate dinner with the uh, second in command of the Germans on that ship I was on, the first officer. And uh, his wife at the dinner table openly talked about how much she hated the reptiles. And I remember I thought it was almost like a test. And I kind of looked at him. And he said, it's okay. You can say what you want. And he's like, we don't like them. And I, but I remember that the, the Germans hated the reptiles. But it was just one of those things where they had to deal with them. I don't remember the name of the ship in the Dark Fleet. I remember it was the Nimitz in uh, Solar Warden. But my duty originally, it was to be a pilot. And I was like... Uh, under a woman who was also like kind of like in the same where I was a, a, a conscript. I think she was above me. She was like a bloodline. They have bloodlines, which are were bo above us. And then I was nearly like last of the uh, totem pole, which is a uh, conscript. And bloodlines are like people that they have like uh, soul contracts. Maybe they usually get picked up when they're children. And then they get, they, they do 40 years. They get educated in like German schools on you know the german world they get taught how to speak german when it came to us with the conscripts they didn't want us to learn german they didn't they, they wanted to be able to speak german in front of us and not know what they're saying but uh yeah originally it was to be a pilot and but then they found out that i was in the middle east they found out i was in iraq and it seemed almost kind of uh like they romanticized it like oh wow you were in the middle east you know rommel and stuff i guess is what they were thinking uh, but as soon as they found out that I was already in the Middle East, I, I became almost like a like a chief or a like a sergeant. Where I, I went on Mars, it was I was mostly on Mars. It was usually to get like uh, mantises for information, and uh, it was usually uh, I would break in officers too, like German officers that were brand new that just got out of the academy and stuff like that. I would teach them like how to survive, where to go, things like that. So. Yeah, I went from like a pilot to to like uh, infantry. I was back and forth on Mars. Like all, we were almost always we always orbited Mars pretty much. That's pretty much what the name number one thing I did was. I got information. Like I said, everything in the universe kind of has like a click, and uh, everything kind of has its own thing. Uh, us, I think, is art, our art, our artistic. We kind of stand out like that, but mantises are masters at like DNA and DNA manipulation and things like that, and they can't stand the uh, reptiles. So we would actually have to physically get them, come and get them, take them to the ship. They'd put them in a machine that got the information they wanted. They didn't have to interrogate them or anything. It just got what it wanted from their mind, and we would bring them back. When I was in the Dark Fleet, that's mostly what I did was Mars. I was either orbiting Mars or... Uh, on Mars, and the main mission there was to get um, mantises, they call them. They call them bugs, the uh, Germans. But uh, mantises are very good with DNA, manipulating DNA, genetically augmenting other beings, things like that in the womb. They're very good at that. So um, the reptiles and the dark fleet wanted them because uh, the mantises don't like especially the reptiles they don't want to work with them and uh there's that and 
I also remember there were spiders. I remember being told that. I live in the caves on Mars and things like that. I remember that. Um, three meters in diameter is what they were about, around about 10 feet. Pretty big. Um, the mantises, the ones I remember, they had uh, three pairs of l arms, legs, whatever you want to call them. And they both had like three kind of like sharp fingers, like uh, exoskeleton sharp fingers. And um, if they were working, I remember they could prop themselves up on their hind legs and use their two sets of hands to work. And they can, if they were running after you, they could run either on all six legs or they could just run with the four and hold a weapon with the two front legs. Um, they look kind of like mantises. Uh, their front legs, they would fold them almost like a mantis, like a praying mantis. They would fold them down. Um, they were very, very smart, um, extremely telepathic. And I would say they were the most human like as far as their manners. In the sense that if they invited you into their home, they would immediately offer you food and drink. They would ask you to please sit down, things like that. Other ETs really don't do that. You have to ask pretty much for everything with other ETs. But they would be, they were very humble and they would offer you things. And uh, I remember they were so telepathic that even if you weren't a telepath, they would still be able to pick up your thoughts. And they wouldn't actually speak out loud. They would just telepathically tell you what they wanted to tell you, even if you had no telepathic ability whatsoever. And I remember they were like so telepathic when they laughed. I remember their mandibles would open up on their mouth, and it was kind of uh, unsettling. And I remember they would cover their mouth they would, for to be polite. And they laughed too. That was another thing. They would they they would you can get them cracking up if you just joke with them like a person. And most of the ETs you can't do that. But they were very, like I said, as far as their actual demeanor and the, the way they acted and their, their their politeness and everything, it was very much like from Earth. I, I kind of had a, uh, you know, like a castle doctrine kind of policy with them in the sense that, you know, your house is your castle and no one really has the right to k kick your uh, doors in and things like that and intrude on your castle. So I had a policy where I would just knock on the door and if they refuse to let me in, I said, well, I'm going to be here for a long time and I'll be waiting for you. And once you leave your home, you know, I will get you and I'll hurt you if you don't give yourself up right now and almost always they uh worked with me and uh they were very polite and they liked the fact that i just didn't when it like my very first assignment i remember it was i was with another guy and i was just doing what he told me to do and he just kicked you know he just, he just knocked his way into their home and threw him on the ground and everything else and was beating him and i figured that you could get probably more cooperation with them if you just treated them more decently. So I, I just had a policy where I treated them more polite and I would never kick their door in. And they seemed to like that a lot. And I got a lot more. Um, that's how I got so much more cooperation from them was this, that. My main job was to just uh, get, uh, get mantises, targets, this mantis targets. And I would pick them up. And I would bring them back to the ship, and they would get all the information they wanted out of them. It wasn't through any kind of torture or anything like that. It was just some machine that got everything, all the knowledge they wanted from them. And I would just bring them back to their homes, and that was it. I remember I did have some interaction. There was almost like a a reptilian kind of a, like a breakaway, almost, from the regular reptilian empire or whatever. And they had, I think, longer snouts. They looked almost like alligator-like, and they were... Uh, Almost like Amish, I guess you would say, with ETs in the sense that they didn't like modern technology. Uh, the only thing they really used were these hot rocks they would put in, a, in, a, in like a hole and they could cook with it. If you put them like two together, it would get really hot of these stones. And uh, yeah, that's really the only thing they used. Besides that, it was just, they would just use spears and things like that. It was very low tech. Oh, there's like a lot of... Uh, Four-legged reptiles, like iguana, a type of like a monitor lizard kind of looking things. A lot of like stuff like that everywhere, and I believe that's what pre probably what the spiders live mostly off of. It, that's why they live in the caves because uh, I don't think they spin webs and they use the caves as like their webs. They just stay inside the caves and they wait for vibrations, 
And uh, so, you know, little, these reptiles, these, uh, you know, monitor lizards and things like that during sandstorms, because there's sandstorms a lot on Mars, they'll go into the caves for shelter. And then that's how they get caught. And I believe that, you know, how the spiders survive. And I never had to really run away from a spider before on Mars, but I remember there was a German officer. He was new. He was young. And it was one of the ones I was supposed to be breaking in. And um, one of the uh, mantises ran into the, one of the caves. And the mantises are so telepathic, they could control the spiders. Uh, I was told that they're about as smart as a dog. And, uh, yeah, they can be controlled by these mantises. So the mantis ran into the cave. And this young German officer was running after him. And I told him to stop. And uh, these spiders ran out, jumped out. And he got the first two. But then the third one got him. And uh, they have, a, I remember they had like pincers almost, like a dung beetle, where they would kind of lock onto you and hold you and then dig their uh, fangs into you. And it grabbed a hold of him around his waist. And uh, he kind of leaned back like he was being bear hugged. But he kept on leaning back and to the point where he just snapped in half. It just, it snapped him right in half. And his head fell on the ground. His legs crumbled apart. And... Uh, I was cloaked at the time. These suits can cloak. What I would usually do if one of the mantises ran in, I would just cloak and I would wait. And I remember the, a spider or two would run out and they would usually run out and they had these front, just like a regular spider, they had kind of like these front little hands or legs, these front little legs, and they would slam them on the ground and wait. And they would, they would spin around real quick, slam them on the ground and wait. And it was almost like a way of bluffing you into getting you into run so they could pick up your vibrations. So I would just, if one of them, if they ever ran out, one of the advances went into a cave and they ran out, I would just cloak and just stay still. And they would, just like a dog, they would lose attention and then they would go back into the cave. They'd do it for like 30 seconds and then they'd just kind of lose attention to it and they'd go back in their caves. And so that way the mantis would be more likely to come out because he would think, you know, maybe they killed me or something rather than me killing them and him knowing that I was still alive. Uh, but yeah, but this German officer, he did that. He ran after him. They cut him in half. And I was cloaked, but it was so surprising to me. I, I kind of jumped back. I took a couple steps back, and it knew right away where I was, the spider. And it just started coming at me. And uh, so I, I started uh, shooting it. And it made a sound similar to, like, a, a wounded rabbit, like a screaming kind of sound, like screaming and nails on a chalkboard kind of. And, yeah, I just kept on shooting it and shooting it. And I remember one of its legs was taken out, and it was still coming. It was, like, hobbling. But, yeah, and then it eventually just stopped. We got that guy back, and he was okay. We got him into a, you know, a healing tank, and got him healed up. He was punished by the reptiles, though. I remember for not listening to me. On Mars, I remember there were like desert shrubs, as far as plant-wise, just small little shrubs everywhere. Um, I I think we went like further north near the pole of Mars, and I remember there being like there was snow, and I remember like redwood like big redwood trees, giant trees. And I think that's the only place that really rains or snows is on like the poles or near the poles. Um, and as far as my suits that I wear, they give you like these black cloaking suits and uh, they're really good for like high velocity kind of rounds. They're good for taking fire, whether it's like, you know, uh, plasma, laser or like rail gun. But they're not very good at all at like close combat, uh, taking, getting stabbed, getting cut. They're not really that great at stopping. There's different kinds of armor that ETs use. And the thing about ET tech is that it'll do something very special and specific and it'll do that better than anything else. But it's not really that great on doing other things. And yeah, I mean, but that was a suit. And with Mars, you could walk or you could uh, just sit down and you were fine. But if you tried to run, you would pass out from lack of oxygen. It was kind of like, you know, running in the mountains or, you know, running in like the Himalayas. It was, you could walk and everything or just sit down and you were fine. But if you tried to run, you passed out. I think it had about 20% of the oxygen that the earth had. So as far as getting uh, involved with the Tejitas and stuff from the Dark Fleet, I, uh, I was in the Dark Fleet, and by this time, I was working on becoming an officer. They accepted me, and it was one of the first times they ever did that. I think Robert, the executive officer, he said they never did that before. And um, we went to some sort of, 
I guess you would call it like a United Nations building. It was almost like a, it was like a space station kind of um, off of a world in space. And uh, it was like a rectangle, I would say, with the corners, the two clear walls on the corners and the ceiling was clear. And uh, when you look behind you, there were like um, floors, about five floors of just different, I don't know. It, 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 it was anything to do with like, um, maybe two warring factions talking about peace, but it could also be for trade. ETs love trade, like they they love to they they love trade, and it could have been that too involved in this. And uh, I saw all kinds of stuff. That was like when I saw more things than I I only thought like reptiles and greys maybe existed, but I saw so much stuff, and most of it was only like a foot or two feet tall. It was very small, and uh, I remember the first officer telling me. Um, we're going, we're having a meeting with the, you know, the ones that we're at war with and, uh, nothing's going to happen, but just in case, you know, protect the master. Like if, if they, uh, they come after him, protect them. And, uh, I said, all right. And we walked out and I saw all this stuff and like all these different beings that I didn't know existed. And a man and a woman came up to the master, the, the head reptile. And they were blonde and blue eyed and they're wearing the blue uniforms and everything. And, uh, it was like the way they do things usually is it's usually like the female comes up first. I think a lot of ETs are like this and kind of try to flatter them and uh, get their way that way, being nice and kind and kind of flattering. And that didn't work on the reptile. So uh, the, you know, and it had to do with, it was talking about a, a, like a package they were like referring to it as a package and I didn't know what they were talking about it and she was saying like you know you know the package belongs to us and you took it you know it, it wasn't right that you took it and you know you need to get the package back to us and the reptile said something like well we've invested so much time and you know resources into this package that it now rightfully be uh, belongs to us and so then the man came forward and he had a smart glass pad and I guess it had some sort of document on it and he just started bringing up uh, articles that they violated and things like that and that they needed to re he needed to return the package immediately or it would be considered an act of war. So he read like every line real meticulously and then he kind of just threw his hands up and just turned around and walked away. Then the woman came up to me and she said, you're coming with us now. And so I said, all right. And uh, we went into their ship. It was like a beam ship similar to that, like a Billy Meyer kind of thing. It was like a, like a polished uh, metal kind of saucer. Three people could be in it. Um, I remember it had uh, beds that came out of the floor, three beds. Um, and yeah, I remember that. And they took me there. And then... Um, I remember there was a one of them called I, and then I was at, I was kind of in Solar Warden after that but I was with them more or less but I was in Solar Warden and I remember there was one called a uh, mother like an elder they like there's like uh, elder women they call them a lot of times they call them mother and they're kind of like the uh, school teachers and the midwives on the ship and stuff like that and uh, she was uh, kind of testing me they were basically just trying to see if, you know, the reptiles corrupted me completely or if I had any kind of, I don't know, saving grace or something. And, uh, yeah, she put me through a bunch of tests. And it was almost like a psychotherapy where it was weird. It was kind of like I was reliving these events. And I don't know. It was almost like uh, looking down a timeline but doing it backwards. It was almost like. I was kind of watching myself doing things, but it almost like, a, I don't know, a Christmas Carol, like an out-of-body experience or something. I don't know. I was, I was just observing myself doing all these things. And yeah, so I got with them. Um, I don't know. I played music. I remember that. I remember one time we were eating and uh, I hadn't played anything. It was only like the third day I was there. And uh, I was sitting down at the table to eat and it was the navigator which was oh, sorry the man <laughs> it was the navigator which was the man and then uh 
the woman on the right, and I remember Robert told me her name was Faru eventually, and uh, she was eating, and uh, he was eating, and I was eating, and somehow the reptiles came up, and I said, uh, she said, we knew you were there, but we wanted to keep you there because we wanted you to learn from them. And I remember I said, you mean you knew I was there the whole time and you didn't do anything to try to help me or anything like that? And she said, mm-hmm. She just said it real matter of fact. And I found that it's very insulting. And uh, I just got up and I started playing my guitar. And when I looked up, they were both just staring at me. And they said, how did you do that? Like they were like, they were just amazed. And uh, I think I, I stood up and I yelled out like, that wasn't for you, that was for me, you know, and I, I don't care if I ever see any of you again, I like threw my guitar in the bed, and I remember he started like yelling at me, yelling at me out loud, and he said, uh, you know I could overpower you if I wanted to, Daryl, you know that, don't you? And I said, fuck you, and I just like walked out. And yeah, so I, it was like a rough start, because I don't know, it was, it, they have this kind of bigger picture attitude in the sense that, you know, they want to get what they want to accomplish they're willing to look at the big picture to try to accomplish what they want and they're not above the whole you know you got to break a few eggs to make an omelet kind of attitude as long as they get what they want they, they see things more long term than we do and less short term and uh yeah so i mean i got it started off rough and then it became better and then i wound up uh being with her um, I don't know. It's just like a telepathic thing. It's like you can't keep secrets from telepaths. It's like they know what you want deep down inside. And uh, so, yeah, that happened. And I was with her. I was uh, Faru. And then I had a baby with her. And I didn't know they do something. And nobody told, told me. They have an expression. They say you need the experience. And she told me one time. She said, when I have the baby, I'm going to change. And I said, all right. And I just thought, I don't know she was going to change or something like a woman from earth maybe and uh she's and then once they tell you once they're not going to tell you again and that's it and then you need the experience after that and uh she had the baby and she just became enthralled by this baby she just all it was was the baby she held the baby was with the baby fed the baby that was it if i did say something to her she would just say two or three words to me and then that was it and then uh, I wanted to hold the baby, and I tried to hold the baby from her. And uh, she wound up hitting me, like punching me or something like that. And they're, they're, gen they're genetically augmented to the womb as well. So they're about as strong as a, as a strong man from Earth. And she hit me, and it knocked me down. I went to get back up, and I was going to say something like, you know, why did you do that? Why did you hit me? And uh, she just started screaming. And uh, so I just walked out. And I wound up telling uh, the navigator about it. It was bothering me, and I told him. And uh, he said, you need to talk to Elder. And Elder was Mother's husband. And he's kind of like the, uh, he's like an older male, older man, and uh, very tall. He's very tall. White beard, white hair. Um, he uh, He's kind of like the, I don't know, judge. He's like the courts. If there's a dispute or something like that, he kind of deals with things like that. And uh, so I saw him, explained to him what's going on. I said, I didn't know this was, he, he, he told me, he's like, uh, when I touched the baby, I, I was lucky she didn't bite me in the face, bite my face. And I said, is that something common they do? He said, yes. And I said, well, why didn't anybody tell me this? He told me that they go into like kind of like a state where it's like a bonding with the baby and they stay that way for months, like about 10 months, they stay that way. And, uh. I said, why did anybody tell me that? And eventually he said, you're right. He said, somebody should have told you this. And I think I even said out loud, like, oh, thank God. Like, thank you. Like, somebody finally agreed with me. And uh, I said, and, and then he said, well, you know, this other woman, she just came to the ship. And uh, I said, nah, you know, I don't want to do that. I want to, I want to stay with, you know, Maru. And he said, uh, that's just the way it is. And that's just kind of like, he even went, well, that's just the way it is. He said it like that. And so I was like, well, then I became involved with her, this uh, other woman. And uh, the, what, it, what it is, is the men, the women do this like 10 month bond, bonding process. And then the men, they rut, they kind of go into like the male equivalent of going into heat. 
like uh, every six months for or every six months for about two weeks. So it's like she's bonding, he's writing. So it's almost like they kind of evolve to have this more than just more than one partner. It's not like a social thing or anything like that. It's just the way they are, like physically. So yeah, that happened, and then I wound up getting back with Haru, and I was with both these women, and uh, I went to. Um, I mean, I was just on the ship for a long time, and it just became, you know, I just became part of them. Um, how did I get to the world? I mean, uh, I got to the world, just, we arrived, and I remember, it was the first time she said, uh, look up, um, you can see the ship, and it was the first time I saw the, uh, the actual starship. They take smaller craft, they, you know, they take like those saucer kind of ships, you know, uh, so many people at a time, and they just shuttle back and forth, almost like with like an aircraft carrier with smaller boats, they just shuttle you, because it's just too big, you can't land it on a world or anything like that, so you just get shuttled onto these ships, and, uh, she said, look, and I look, and I remember the ship was able to uh, make its ceiling clear so you could just look right through it. And I looked up and I got to see the starship. And Robert told me it looked like one of the ships from Battlestar Galactica. And it looked similar to that. It had like the buttresses on the side for propulsion system and things like that. And But it was like a, a really dark haze gray, almost black. It was just like a deep dark, like what they paint, you know planes and ships and things like that they pay they paint them that that gray so it looks like the you know the, the haze of the horizon it's a form of camouflage so it was kind of like a haze gray but much darker almost black and uh yeah i saw that and as far as their own home world what do they do what do they things like that how do they dress um they have different kinds of dress they have like casual just like us they have like a casual and a formal and the casual looks almost like ancient Greek. They wear like tunics and things like that. And then the uh, the formal is more like a, they almost wear, I don't know, like a robe, like a long kind of shirt with a belt. And then they kind of throw like a lab coat over top of that. And that's kind of like their formal wear. And they wear like, I don't know, kind of earth tone colors. They wear like blues and yellows and, you know, even light pinks, things like that, greens. Um, the environment was very temperate, except for they had complete control over their weather. So there was lots of pines, uh, lots of granite mountains. So it looked kind of like the Rockies or Norway. But then it also had kind of like tropical plants, like big leaf plants, leaves that had like banana leaves kind of looking. So they had pines, but they also had like tropical. Uh, lots of water, you know, lakes, rivers. Um, I remember Robert said to me, uh, he said, when I was getting out of the Navy, he said, do you like to fish? And I said, sometimes. And he's like, you, he said, you liked it a lot. He said, yeah, you started to uh, bow fish there. And uh, I remember, yeah, I started the bow fish. I taught, there was a guy named Leader and his son. And Leader was like the leader. He was a warrior cast. His son was a warrior cast. And I got them into bow fishing. So we all started both and they loved it. And uh, I remember... In the middle of the city, there was like a city, and I would just order what I wanted, like on the smart glass pad. And I would walk to the city, and there was like this woman there behind a counter, and she would just give you whatever you uh, requested to be made. And she would she would only ask like, "What is this for?" and things like that. I would tell her, and it was just like that. And most of the time, they stay in their homes and they uh, study, and their homes are almost like uh, I don't know kind of like cabins they, they're not they don't you know they don't have the logs or anything but they're the small like cottages they're not very high tech at all i mean there's things like on the furniture they always drape I, like i had like a chair almost like this that i sat in and there was like a couch in front of me and like a coffee table and a small another chair next to me and another single person chair to my left and the right a couch in front and me in this chair and uh they always drape these brown like sheets almost on top of the couches and uh I, it's the same kind of similar tech as their uniforms those blue uniforms but what it does is it eats the skin cells and things like that so things like dust really isn't a problem they, they don't get that dusty they don't get dirty there's all these kind of preventive maintenance kind of things where you 
they don't really get that dirty to begin with, so there's not really not really much necessary need for cleaning. Um, they love fish. I didn't really see them eat big game or anything like that. They didn't. I didn't see any like kind of cows or deer or anything like that. But they eat fish a lot. They let, they're mostly fruit and vegetable. On the ship, they eat only fruit and vegetable. Uh, they want it to be extremely uh, fresh within 20 minutes after picking it. Uh, they say that's part of their longevity, why they live so long, as they eat extremely fresh food. Food and uh, but you know they couldn't have a, I don't know, a hatchery on the fish. It would just be too big. It wouldn't be feasible. And uh, so they just drink like a type of blue liquid with their meal while they're on the ships, and that's like that gets all your amino acids, fatty acids, you know, proteins and things like that, animal proteins, because they don't eat the, eat any only fish. And uh, I remember about a third of the ship is um, like a hydroponics farm. And um, and I remember they, they called it service. As part of your service, you have to work on the farm once a week. About Even the captain, who was from Earth, like even the captain had to work on the ship or on the, on the hydroponics farm. And I remember like uh, there were bags and they said uh, nitrogen on it. Like, you know, they were just regular like hydroponic. Like, and you would go up with the nitrogen bag and you crack it like over this big water, uh, like a tub of water. And it was almost like a water treatment plant where it had a big stirrer in it that moved really slow and you cracked it over and you put everything in there and that's what fed the plants. And yeah, it was just like a hydroponics farm basically. And it was a third of the ship and that's, they would eat extremely fresh. They wouldn't eat anything like, they didn't have, I don't know, what's it called? The Star, Star Trek, the, uh. Replicators. I didn't. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure they had tech like that, but they felt that, you know, they always wanted to go to the natural path. Even when it came, if it came to making clones or or whatever, they would. They did not want to accelerate the growth of the of the clone. They didn't want to put it in a chamber. A woman would uh, carry the clone in her womb, and the clone would just grow natural. They, they didn't do anything that accelerated growth. And it's not until uh, puberty where they get their tech in them. And as soon as they go into puberty. They, they get all their tech, but it's no artificial intelligence. They don't use any, any kind of AI. Um, if anything major happens to you, like a major injury, you'd have to go like to a, a smart glass pad and tell the uh, tech to just concentrate on this one area because it just doesn't have artificial intelligence the way other tech does. And uh, it accelerates their growth of the kids. So, yeah, they're, th- th- that's how that works. And But they, they leave them grow completely natural until throughout their whole trial that they don't get any kind of uh, any kind of tech put in their bodies and they just have a and the kids are just kind of like kids they get jealous um, they get in the fights the boys will get in the fist fights sometimes um, but it's almost like as soon as they go in, after puberty it's just like they kind of change and they become a lot more I don't know somber and it's serious and they it's hard to get them laughing. But I remember the warrior cast and stuff are a lot more like men from Earth. They kind of break each other's balls and stuff like that. You know, they, they have that mentality. and They'll crack up and get them laughing and stuff like that. So, yeah, they're a lot more like... And then the, regu- the regular men, you can tell a joke and they might like get it, but they would just look at you and then that would be the end of it. They wouldn't find it very funny. When the Tajitans, whenever they get... I think around 2,000 years. They live around 3,000 years. But once they get around 2,000 years, their bones begin to grow again, but very slowly. And, uh, but their organs don't grow. And that's actually how they die. It's just organ failure. They get just too big for their heart to pump blood anymore. And all their organs kind of go up higher and higher, and their intestines just kind of stretch lower and lower. And, uh, yeah, um, they do that, and... I think it's about, yeah, 3,000 years they die, but yeah, I mean, they go through growth. Yeah, um, Elder was about 14 and a half feet tall, and he was very old, I think. I think he was a warrior cast as well, but very old. And uh, yeah, I mean, they grow. And it's strange, too. I don't know if they, they, I think they lose bone density in the sense that they seem to stay the same weight almost, even though they grow, they get very uh, slim, very skinny. Their, their skin becomes almost like, uh, as they get taller and taller, their skin becomes almost like transparent, where you can kind of start seeing the uh, 
like blue veins underneath and things like that. Just like elderly people here, if their skin just gets, but their skin gets much thinner. Like mother was uh, about seven feet. She was a, an older woman. and uh, But you couldn't really see that transparency, but they get almost this kind of look, the men and the women, because their bones keep growing, where somebody who gets is on the verge of getting too much plastic surgery, I guess I would put it, where they get very large cheekbones. They just, and they get that, I don't know, they just get that look where it's not strange or alien looking, but it's just very, very large, high cheekbones. And uh, like the males or jaws become broader and things like that because their bones are growing. It's almost like a growth hormone thing where their bones just grow through another spurt of growth. And they do that till they die. They keep on growing till they die. Yeah, when I, on the world, the cities, the main one I saw was uh, it looked almost like uh, the World Series pennant in the sense that it was like a triangle wedge. And uh, like these, the buildings were like wedges that went way up. And the highest where the king was, that was the highest one. And then it went down a little bit more, down a little bit more, smallest building, and then up, up, and you went back to the largest. And there was like a courtyard in the middle, and it was just all these chain of buildings going up and down. Uh, yeah, I, I did get to meet my, uh, I mean, I raised my kids. It, it, their, their raising is, is different than us in the sense that uh, after the mom gets done, you know, bonding with them after the first year, they pretty much just go like straight into school. And that would be like where mother would do. She was like, you know, the headmaster of the school that she had like, you know, teachers to help her and things like that. But she was like the head of it. And the, what they teach them is their uh, past lives. That's what they learn. They relearn all their past lives. So it's almost like an educational thing in itself where, you know, if you've been a pilot, if you've been this, you've been that, you know, if you worked in a hydroponic farm, they just know all these things automatically because they remember all their past lives, even if they've never really studied for it before. And uh, I remember on the ship one time, I, I used to visit my kids after work for an hour or two. And I remember um, mother called me to her room and she said, I'd like you to stop seeing your children after work every day and I said why and she said it's making the other uh, children jealous because their parents don't do that and I, I made a deal with her where you know I said well why don't you get all the parents to come after work for an hour or two to visit their kids I said if you don't want me to do it then I'll stop doing it but you see how much my kids like it and why don't you try to get all the others to come and visit their children every day after they get off work and she did it and it worked and um it's just they've just been doing things for so long that they kind of get stuck in their ways and they, they just don't see it in any other way. The reason why they made me king, I remember Robert said they were using you. They were using, he, and then he smiled and he said, but you didn't mind. Um, because the king had uh, 200 princesses. And what it was was they wanted me to become the king because they can look down timelines. And uh, the, the two women I was with at the time, I was with leader, like female leader. And I was with uh, Swaru. And I was with them at the time, and I didn't want to leave them. I was happy with them, so I didn't want to leave them. And uh, they figured that, you know, if they worked on my ego and made me the king or whatever, I would just kind of fall into place and do what they wanted me to do, which was, you know, they wanted uh, less than 2% of the people of Earth are genetically compatible enough with them to have children. And so when it comes around, they try to take advantage of it because they've just, they're have they kind of uh, genetically stagnant. They, they're, they're such an old species, and they've just stayed with themselves. And They're not inbred, but they're you know genetically stagnant. They're kind of like Iceland or whatever, like the people there and stuff. They're trying to get other people into their gene pool. And uh, that's what it was. And I remember one time I was with the queen, and I said, why do I have to sleep with so many women? Because I was just getting tired of it. And I remember she said, uh, to ensure the survival of your lineage. And uh, that was her response. And yeah, I mean, that was it. And I remember I asked the king, after the king took his power back, and I asked him, I said, why'd you do that? Why did you, why did you lie to me? You know, I, I don't like, I didn't like being manipulated like a, like a kid. And he said, we didn't think you would do it if we told you the truth. So we just did it like that. And that's what it was for. It was just, they looked at my timeline, they, they pretty much figured that, I, was, I wouldn't be willing to do it unless, you know, they played on my ego. And that's how it worked. 
Now, they weren't necessarily all my children or they were my kids to begin with. I just kind of said that in the sense that, you know, they're from Earth. I'm from Earth. They're my kids in that sense. Um, what it was was Akino was torturing me for so long, the reptile that possessed Akino, the body of Akino, whatever that is. And uh, like I said, when you come out of that density chamber, you go through a temporary kind of amnesia. And I didn't know what was happening. I thought I was just being, I thought I woke up in like a nightmare and I was being tortured by, you know, snake monsters and stuff like that. I didn't know what the hell was happening. And uh, it kind of just came to and I just kind of got a moment of clarity. And I said, oh, right, this is who I am. I forgot. And uh, I, yeah, I told the Kino, I said, you, you've committed an act of war. I said, I'm the king of the Tagetans and you committed an act of war. And they did, they, ETs do like a, a kind of a, uh, their war is like uh, cat and mouse time travel and things like that. So it was like, they knew that I was going to be killed and they knew I was going to be tortured for poking that one reptile in the eye. That's like punishable by death as far as they're concerned for a human to touch a reptile. But even if it is like a warrior cast or a working cast, but, uh. It, yeah, it was a way to keep me alive, and not only to keep me alive, but it was also a way to, like, legally declare war on them. Because even they themselves have, they have a really, believe it or not, like, convoluted kind of law system the way we do. Contracts are extremely important to them. You have to follow contracts. Um, there's something called the balance, they call it, where it's like karma, you know, and, it, and if you don't do as you, you say you're going to do, you know, they, they'll say things like, you know, but you must think of the balance. In other words, you know, this is going to come back to get you in the end. And I, I mean, like I said, I have memories of going to the mines and clearing them out and things like that. Uh, well, or not the mines, I'm sorry, the, the caverns where the children are kept, you know, deep within the earth, deeper than the underground bases. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I was talking to Robert, the executive officer, and I asked him if uh, this place you know, where I was at St. Morgan, would it be cleared? He said, we're working on it. And uh, it was difficult to, to gauge what he meant by we're working on it because he time traveled so much. But he did tell me it would, uh, the Navy would leave, the U.S. Navy, and that's already happened, where the Joint Maritime Force, the JMF part, would be no more, and it would just be Royal Air Force. And now it's just a Royal Air Force base. And he told me about that. But yeah, I mean, as far as this is chrome stuff, I mean, I don't really think it, it it's around. Maybe they have a synthetic form. He also told me that, uh, Robert, that the way they would get them to turn on each other, these people who are addicted to a chrome, he said they would just lock them in a cell and just wait because the withdrawal is so horrible. And the whole, they would just dangle a carrot in front of them, which would be the chrome. And be like, you want a hit of this? You know, you're going to have to tell us, you know, who's all in this, who are your buddies, who are your friends, and things like that. And he told me that Tom Hanks would not talk. I remember that. He said he wouldn't talk. He said he, they were surprised. Like, he didn't turn on anybody. But he said it didn't matter because, you know, they already had everything to begin with. So they already know who's involved with it. It doesn't matter. As far as working on a book's concerned, I am working on a book. I'm, I'm getting help. But I'm also getting, there's also people just always offering to write a book for me or a screenplay or you know I've been getting officers to do uh, different shows and things like that on the internet not, not just regular interviews but actual shows where they have small little animation bits and things like that and I've been showed storyboards from different guys and things like that who want to turn this into a, a story a short movie or maybe a longer movie of some sense I don't know but yeah books definitely in the works books take a lot longer than I thought but yeah, it's happening. Please consider supporting Super Soldier Talk by purchasing your own Neo Meditation device. Your Neo Meditation device will help you reduce stress, integrate trauma, enhance intuition, enhance clairvoyance, and enhance creativity. Get yours now at www.neologicaltech.com.